Hello and welcome to Terra Scottish Football Podcast Extra. My name is Sean McGuigan and on this occasion I am joined by someone who recently invaded a pitch. It is of course Craig Telfer. Craig, how are you? Oh, Sean, brilliant. I'm absolutely delighted to be here speaking to you and I'm absolutely delighted to finally get the chance to talk about something that I never thought would happen in my entire lifetime. Of course, what Craig Telford is referring to is the fact that Sinus Muir have won their very first league title after 140 years. Their 0-0 draw with East Fife at the weekend was enough to stagger them over the line. And Craig, as much as it's been a long, drawn-out process, Saturday was, was finally the occasion where it was confirmed. Talk me through your day. Talk me through how it, how it felt, how it went. Yeah, Saturday's the best day of my life. There's no other way to describe it. Saturday's the best day of my life, and it's it's something that I think we have known for a long time. You can maybe, even if you were perhaps a bit more optimistic, you could have gone all the way back to January when Stennis Muir were really beginning to pull ahead from the rest of the teams in the division. You thought Stennis Muir were going to win the league, but for me, it was when they beat Bonnie Rig at the start of March 1-0. This is, of course, after the back of losing 6-1 to Clyde. They go and follow that with a 1-0 win at Bonnie Rig, and it's hard fought. You know, you really need to dig in to, to get the, the win. And on top of that, with results going elsewhere, I think uh, Peterhead and the Spartans both lost on the same day. I mean, we were going into the final quarter, nine games left to play with, a, I think it was a 17-point mm-hmm. advantage at the top of the table. And at that point, I was thinking, we're going to win the league because it was, there was the only team in that division who had shown any consistency over the course of the season were Stennis Muir. Everyone else could, just couldn't put together on a games. So at that point, I knew we were going to win the league. But it's a big difference between having that feeling that you know you're going to win it and it actually being confirmed and fucking hell, man. It was... I, I, I don't think I can properly describe that feeling, Sean. The match itself between Stennis and East Fife, it wasn't a particularly good game. Few Chances few and far between. There was a really strong wind blowing across the pitch, so there, there, there wasn't really any opportunity for, for, for much quality. Our game finished nil-nil. And at that point, so I, I normally sit up the back of the stand at Oakleview. I was like, right, I'm sort of pushing folk out of the way so I can get down to the get down to the wall at the front because I knew it was coming. And you're just waiting. The players are all shaking hands with the East Five fans. I beg your pardon, these five players. And then we're kind of half looking at the players, half looking up at the stand. Everyone's got their phones out and they're checking the scores. And it comes through that Peter Head have drawn at Bonnie Rig, meaning they, they can't win the league. And that is it, over the wall and, and, and just piling into them. And you're just... You lose your, you lose control of your senses. You're just running, and you're just running. Where's the, where's the melee? And I could see, I can think it was like, like Bradley Rodden and Ben Sterling coming towards me, and and like no disrespect them, but they've kind of been French players since they've come in. I'm, I'm looking for, uh, I want a Nicky Jamison or a Gergie Buchanan <laughs> or Ross Meekin or you or O'Reilly, and I see you and, uh, and that's it. Just like jump into him, and then there's Nicky and and that, and it's just like you're seeing, you're seeing people that that you've you've been in, you, you see for years on the pitch and just hugging them and high-fiving them and just cuddling the players and telling them what an achievement this is. I and mean, it was great. You, know, the, you, get, you go off the pitch, the players come back out and they, they, they get the photograph taken in front of the, the League Two winners. And then it was into the, into the wee bar. And, and it was just like, it was carnage. It was like the last days of Rome. And that was one of the good things about it as well, Sean, was the fact that the players could easily have had somewhere booked elsewhere. You know, they could have finished up, spent about half an hour or so in the club, changed and out to Glasgow or out to Edinburgh, somewhere like that. Mm-hmm. But they stayed in Oakle View all night. And so going between the, the, the wee bar, which, which you've been in a great wee place, and going between the wee bar and the changing rooms themselves, it was, it was, it was pitch black. It was brilliant. You had players like Jim, fuck you, Peter Head, Sterry's won the league. <laughs> Sterry's won the league. Another good one there as well is, fuck Jack Healy, Sterry's won the league. Sterry's won the league. I'd say, history, history, we're the famous Sterry's here and we're making history. Just relentless. And what, like, I'm talking a lot here, but just one of my favourite bits of the whole night was the players were sort of coming through from the changing rooms to the wee bar one by one. If you know the, the layout of Oakville View, when you go into the reception area, you've got the wee bar there. Then you go through like a secure door and mm-hmm. the change rooms are just in there. And the players were coming through one by one. 
And as soon as they, as soon as like the, the fans were shouting like, we want Bruni, we want Bruni, we want Bruni. And then someone would go and fetch Adam Brown and bring him through. <laughs> just, hey! just piling into him, singing shampoo. And we want that, we want that, we want that. And big Nat Weatherburn coming in. And it was just, it was brilliant, man. And I was there till about the back of 11. And at that point, I'd, I'd kind of run my race. I think everyone was a bit, bit worse, the, worse for wear. The players were still all going off their heads in the in the change rooms. And after that, I went back to my mum's, woke up the next day, like hung over. And just that feeling, that feeling, man, it, it's incredible. It still hasn't properly sunk in. It still hasn't properly sunk in. I remember on the day, that I'll, I'll finish up here, but on the day prior to the match, I, I put a tweet out saying, I've got a feeling this could be the best day of my life. Uh-huh. And there's a guy called Sam Tennant, who's an Albion Rovers fan, replied to me. and he, uh, So Albion Rovers won the league, I think it was like 2015, uh-huh. when they won the league two title. And Sam said, it's the best feeling in the world. Like, I still think about it. I still think about it. Every day, just for a bit, I still think about it. And I thought, that's, I didn't understand what he meant. But now, now I do. I think I'm going to be thinking about this every single day for the rest of my life, man. Now, see, going back to the, the, the pitch invasion or when you ran on the park, I, I've done it twice. Did you, when you initially ran on, do you have that rush of adrenaline? Uh, you're absolutely pumped. Did you then start to feel a bit sheepish as to why you were on there? No. Like, did, did that ever filter through? No. I, no, I, felt no. A bit, I'm like, I'm not entirely sure I should, I should be here. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. Because it, it's, it's just this, this is a moment, Sean. I've been following Stennis here for 20 years now. And there's been, in that time, there's been two promotions, which, which have been class, a couple of really good results in the Scottish Cup, some great games, some great goals, some great players, but there's, there's never been anything tangible. I mean, Stennis mm-hmm. as a club, their greatest success came back in 1995 when they won the Challenge Cup, when they beat Dundee. That was good Stennis Muir side, a very good Dundee United side. So that's, that's always been the club's claim to fame. But w- when you look at the SPFL, the teams that, that haven't won a trophy, up until Saturday, ourselves, Elgin City, Annan Athletic, Edinburgh City, Bonnie Rig, the Spartans. Now, these teams have all won regional titles, yep. but never since they come to the SPFL, but they've only been in the SPFL. Elgin have been in what, since the early 2000s? Mm-hmm. We've been in it since 1900, whatever, and had nothing to show for it until then. So it just felt like, it just felt like this sense of, this, this relief, and just wanting to, to share it with this group of players. Like the, the, they're just an incredible bunch. They, they deserve all the achievements of manager, Brown Ferguson. They deserve a huge pat on the back as well. It was just, it was joy, but it was catharsism as well. Like all that bad stuff. I was thinking back, weirdly enough, to one of my first appearances on the terrace. And this was back in Fowler's old flat in Forest Park back in 2013. So 11 Yuck. years ago. Aye, but back in the, the, the big big table full of glasses and the, 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 the no curtains. <laughs> You, you, know, you know what I mean? It was absolutely filthy. But I remember one of the first games talking about Stenny Smear, it was when they, they were beaten by Dunfermline Athletic 5-4 at home when Stenny held a 4-2 lead with six minutes to go and ended up chucking away. And it's just, we've come from, from that, which is like a, a, a humiliation that, that you would see at like on a national level when people are looking through the scores. How on earth did that happen? <laughs> we've gone from that to being able to talk about it. This and uh, just running the park, it was just, there's just something... This this feeling, this this inexplicable, overwhelming feeling just completely took charge of my body. And that was it. Just wanting to you just want to cuddle people. That's all you're looking for. You're just looking for like a human touch. You're just wanting this energy and just thinking <laughs> by touching other people who are feeling the same as you. It's just ah, oh, it was amazing, man. It was so, amazing. So I, I think I, I think we mentioned that on the first uh a view from the terrace at the start of this run, so this run of ten, that the fact that when Presumably Stenny, because uh, we knew it, it was a case of uh, when rather than if. That when they won the league, it'd be great if it happened at Oakleview because you had the because you had the wee bar. We knew it was going to be like a, a, a brilliant. It's already a great setup. So to to add up to add in a, a first ever title win to a great setup was always going to be a, a tremendous way to celebrate your first ever title. However, the fact that on maybe been Sunday I noticed maybe that was when you uploaded the pictures. The fact that you were in the dressing room celebrating with the players, like I was, A, I thought it was amazing. So I was like, my goodness, that looks 
incredible. And it's probably the first time that I have ever been thinking to myself, I wish I was a Stenish Muir fan. Because that, like, imagine, like, I, I was thinking to myself, like, imagine being able to celebrate a Ruth Rovers title win with the players in the dressing room. You've literally kind of, yeah. it's kind of living the dream. <laughs> So I, I I always think the change room sort of like like off limits to, mm-hmm. to normal partners because that's very much the, yep. the the players' domain. But I was I was standing at the edge of the bar, so you're, the players the players were coming in, so you would maybe get a couple in. They, they were all they were all being there in big numbers, but then they would they would go back to the the, the change room and so on, and, and a couple would come back and, and forward and so on. But I was standing outside the wee bar and Ian Fitzpatrick, who's the head of media, the outgoing head of media as well, he'll be a massive loss when he when he goes elsewhere. But he was he was saying if you. You've been through the changing rooms. I said, I was like, no, is, is, is that all right to go through? He said, come on, come on, I'll bring you in. And so he takes me, he takes me through the doors and down the corridor. And, and Ross Meakin, well, hopefully we'll come on and talk a bit more about Ross Meakin, but Ross Meakin sees, sees me and he goes, right, boys, right, boys, we've got a celebrity with us. We've got a celebrity. <laughs> so you go to the changing rooms and they, 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 they see me come in and it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> And just everyone jumps in a big pile. Somebody uh, tipped a bottle of Lagro over my head. And then there's a weird bit. He's like, right, right, Craig, 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 sing us a song. Sing us a song. So I tried to sing Golden Years by David Bowie. Got two bars in. Got booed. And then somebody tipped another bottle of Lagro over my head. And then I was just like, fuck you, Peter Headstead. He's running the league. Back into the, the, the sort of more tried and tested stuff. But it was great, man, to, to get the chance to, to go in there and... And it's not. It's one of the things as well. Like I, this, this is something that became really apparent. There was people who had left Oakville View about three o'clock in the morning, and there was still stuff going on there. So it went on all, all night. This is like three or four hours after I'd left. There was stuff still going on. I think as a fan, you knew how tight knit this group of players are together. I think we've spoken about it a number of times. When Stennis Muir score a goal. Everyone celebrates together. All ten outfield players will all come together to, to celebrate. But when you actually see them like that, you actually appreciate how how good it is and how, how much everyone's enjoying themselves. I got speaking to one player who said at his previous club, they were training at like seven o'clock at night. Folk would turn up at like five to seven and mm-hmm. get going. He says it's Dennis Muir. Like people are turning up, the latest people are turning up at training. It's like quarter past six because everyone just wants to be there. And yes, we've won a league, so there's the emotions are quite high, but hearing people talk about your team like that, that's that's amazing to think they've enjoyed it so much. And when you're up close and you see the camaraderie and you speak to the players about how much they've enjoyed it and how much their teammates mean to them and how much their manager means to them, it's great. And just getting to, to see that in the the changing rooms was was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. In, in terms of the, just so you mentioned camaraderie, you, you, you touched on the manager, You've, you've mentioned the fact that the players are, are kind of turning up. They, they want to turn up early mm. for training. Ultimately, you would imagine that all filters through to, to what Gary Naismith has kind of generated at the club. Yeah, I think I think Gary Naismith, and, and I was talking to Tony Anderson about this, so we're, filming, we're recording this on Wednesday, uh, Thursday, the 11th of April, so we were filming a view from the terrace yesterday, and Tony Anderson was in the studio, and I was regaling him with this similar sort of stories there about, about Stennis Muir's season. And if we, we were, he, he was talking about comparing like Naismith to like Barry Ferguson, for instance, and just saying that like Barry Ferguson just had, had this aloofness that he was obviously played in a full-time environment, but just couldn't seem to get his head around that like, like full-time football and part-time football are, I mean, they're, they're the same, but they're, mm-hmm. they're quite different. Yeah. Whereas Gary Naismith, given what he's done in his career, he's played in the Premier League with England, he's won the Scottish Cup with Hearts, you know, very successful career, and I'm going to assume quite a wealthy guy who there probably doesn't need to be managing, mm-hmm. particularly at this level. But the fact that he seems to understand what it takes and how to foster that team spirit and to build it and, and seems to be able to treat players with, with respect, like doesn't talk down at them doesn't seem to if people need time off for anything it's, it's not a hassle and pl- I think the players really really buy into it there's like one of the players was saying that they, they do analysis on a Thursday so they, they go into the wee bar on a Thursday evening and he gets them round it and, and, and talks them about the, the game that's coming up and one of the players was saying like I, 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 every Thursday I'm ready to run through brick walls for him he's completely bought in to what Gary Naismith's doing and that's like that's like just what one player and so if you imagine, compared to what the other players said, if you imagine what, what all these guys are doing, then, then, then what, a, what, a, what a culture that has developed. And 
you can really see that what it means to, to these players to have achieved that as well. I think not just not just for themselves, not just for Stennis Muir and the 140 weight is for the league title, but for each other. I think that's an incredible thing. So, so you mentioned how much it means to the players, but there's like, there's a number of players there who have never won uh, a, a, a league title before. So presumably that means more to them than, than possibly anybody else at the club. Yeah, you, of, of, of course it does. I mean, there was, uh, I watched uh, Sam North's um, vlog that he put out from, from the game. I think he interviewed Darren Jameson, and Darren Jameson's won five league titles. Two of them were with Livingston when he was a kid, and he didn't feature much, but nevertheless, he was still in that environment. But he's won it with Arbroath, he's won it with Kelty Hearts, he's won it with Stennis Muir now. And you compare, so he's, like, I think he quite took it all in his stride, and you want to compare it to someone like Ross Meakin, who... I mean, I, I don't know if you saw his interview in the Falkirk Herald where, mm-hmm. where he spoke about this achievement and it was like, I was reading it and I, I was completely taken aback by it because I've never heard anyone talk about Stennis Muir to, with, with the same passion mm-hmm. that, that he has. I know players come in and out of the club and there are guys who will speak fondly their time at Stennis Muir and, and say they enjoyed it. They enjoyed like the the setup and all that. But I've never seen anyone speak about like how how much it meant to them. Like Ross Meek in his interview saying that he was he looks out for the results. His kids will come will come to Stenny. He'll always be a, like a, a Stenny fan, and it's great. He had a, he was crying when they won the league. Him and his dad was there to see him. That means so much. So I'm delighted. It's his first ever title. He won promotion with the club back in 2018. But for 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 someone like that to win the club's first ever league title. It, I would say it, it makes it extra special, but it, it, it adds definitely a layer of gloss onto it. But had he not, uh, when he came back to the club, did you not have a conversation with him where he aye. he said that's why he was coming back? Aye. He, I think he'd, he'd spoken to a few people and said that, that he was coming back with the club to, to win the league. He'd told people at... In pre-season, a trip to Jersey was talking to some fans and he said he came back to win the league. He was talking to the, the chairman and said he came back to win the league. But I'd spoken to him after our season wrapped up last year. I, I got tickets with Robert Borthwick to go see Hearts Aberdeen. And on Instagram, I took a picture of Time Castle and stuck it up on, on Instagram. Just a little daft thing you do in your stories, just so people know, I'm not in the house, come and burgle me, please. <laughs> But but Ross Beacon replied to it, and it was something that he, he would never normally do, reply to. So he might get like a, a love heart or, or whatever. You never get get a reply, but he said, like, he, it's good, but it's not patch and local view. And in our Stenny group chat, he had we'd been speculating whether or not he was coming back to the club because he'd been liking things on Twitter to do with players coming into the club. And these are the sort of telltale signs that you're looking Always for. Always a sign. Always, Always a, a sign. sign. And I asked him, I said, like, are you, are you coming back? Let's talk about it. And he said, listen, I don't want to say too much, but like, keep, keep your eyes peeled over the next couple of days. And I was like, that would be br- brilliant to have you back. You know, like I loved him as a player. The first time, he, he think he left at the right time after he got promoted in four years at Forfa, a year at Darville. But he said, I'm, I'm coming back to win it. He said, if I, he said, I'm coming back to win it. So fast forward nearly 12 months later, we are on the pitch. I'd said in a view from the terrace, like the first thing I would do is make a beeline for him. I, I, I couldn't see him because there's just there's that much that much going on. I did try try looking for him, but I couldn't see him. And so I finally did see him make eye contact. And he comes up and he and he hugs me and he says to me, I told you. I told you. And it's like that's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Like I, like for, for these players, like it's it's great for them. And I'm really, really proud of them. Really proud of Ross Meakin, guys like Nicky Jameson, Gregor Buchanan. Like Darren Jameson had excellent seasons. I mean, we'll come on and maybe talk about the season as a whole, but it's because of that goalkeeper and that defence is how we won the league because they're absolutely, absolutely fantastic. But I'm really, really grateful to them as well because they've given me the best day of my life. I mean, I'm 37. I think there's still a wee bit of fuel in the tank and there's still, <laughs> there, there, there's still maybe, maybe good things I might be able to experience between now and my death. I mean, if I die, if I get hit by a lorry tomorrow, <laughs> I, I will die happy. I will die very, very happy. But there's been on the pitch there, there. There's just this whole spectrum of supporters. You've got folk there who must have been primary school age that have just got into supporting the club because they're local. High school kids, folk in their 20s, dads with their wee wains running in the park, people my age, and older and older and older. And there'll be folk there like who have been watching the Warriors for like 70 years, longer than that. Nothing to show for it. A Challenge Cup, a couple of promotions. 
now that they finally have that league title, and I'll be eternally grateful to every single one of those players for that. And I mean, you, I, I mean, you will obviously you will have people who have literally lived and died supporting Senesville the entire life and never seen anything, and then Aye. the 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 people who were there on Saturday, the people who have supported them all season or for decades, I suppose, up until this point have been fortunate enough to, yeah. to experience this this title win. It, it, it's incredible. There's the, the conversation that I had with the, the guy, Graham Wallace, who was formerly the Tannoy operator and then basically is now the Tannoy operator again. Um, he had to, to take a wee step back because of uh, his wife's shift pattern or something at work. So that's when I came in and did it for a couple of years. I've said it on discussions with you before that, that Graham was talking about how long his father had been supporting the Warriors for. And he was like, my dad's been sporting for decades and hasn't had to see, hasn't, hasn't had anything to show for it. And the same's probably going to happen to me and you. Now, unfortunately, his father passed away just a, a couple of couple of years ago, so he didn't get to see Steny win the league. But when I saw saw Graham in the wee bar, like he listens to the terrace and yeah. and he, he referenced that conversation and he said, I had a, I had a tear in my eye thinking about my dad. Mm-hmm. Uh, on, on days like this and there'll be loads of people that'll be similar to that, having like a grandparent or someone that they went to the football with that, mm-hmm. that isn't here anymore that, that would have loved to have just uh, just get to see the team do it and so for it to happen in my lifetime where I'm cognizant of everything that's going on I've got my faculties I'm getting the chance to do podcasts about it uh-huh. making a television show about it and getting to talk <laughs> about it it's amazing man absolutely amazing no, no you're right because I know like sometimes it can be not a chore but something in terms of supporting a, a kind of diddy club, it, it can be, a, it's like sometimes you can think, yourself, why on earth am I putting myself through this? To go to Cowden Beath and see a dud mm. like a nil-nil or to go to our growth and see your, your team succumb to a, a, a 3-2 defeat when you'd be 2 up. But ultimately, I, I think, in terms of what you experienced on Saturday, in terms of things that I've went through in my lifetime supporting Reef Rovers, ultimately we've, we can now both say that we've been reasonably fortunate. Aye. I I think so. I think so. I think so. It's I would never, like, I I'd never never judge people for the club they support. You know, if you want to, it's an easy thing to be like glory hunting. But if you want, you want to go and support Rangers and Celtic, fine, go and support Rangers and Celtic. I, I just think that there's 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 great clubs right on your doorstep, and people and people in Stennis Muir and Larbert and what in Kinnaird and the Inchy and so on. If they want to to support our teams, that's fine. That's that's entirely up to them. But come out and see it because. And it's not not to be big headed to that, but if you if you're if you're like say you're a, an old firm fan and you're you're used to a diet of of winning, mm-hmm. like these these things like losing losing a couple of games is is an absolute crisis. And I get that there's levels to football, and I, I wouldn't be so arrogant as to say that what I experienced on Saturday is better what, than what they've experienced. But it's just it's extraordinary. And it's a it's a different kind of feeling. It must be a different kind of feeling. Just I all those days, and I just think of you're, you're right. You think of all the bad times. That's that's the funny thing when you begin to you weigh up the credits and debits inside your skull. You think of like the team in two thousand and six under Des McEwen finished with seventy three points, club's highest ever points total, finished third and didn't go up through the playoffs. You know the, the season completely imploded. I think uh, like Stephen Swift's team. And there's and to be fair to Stephen Swift, there are a number of players that he signed that are still uh-huh. part of the club, like Nicky Jameson, yeah. Mikey Anderson, Nat Wedderburn, Adam Brown, Matty Yates, Ewan O'Reilly. All Stephen Swift signings that have all played a massive part in, in how the season's gone. But I think about his time as manager and just to think how completely underwhelming that was and what a complete waste of time it was. And just what you see what a new manager comes in can identify the problem areas in the team and basically take the building blocks and just like add to them and improve them. That's, that's 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 incredible. I, f- I seem to be finishing every point by saying it's incredible, but it is. <laughs> it is. Words fail me. Words are failing me. Well, listen. I suppose we've started with uh, with the end of the season. What about? Let's go back right back to the start of the season. So there was what one win in the first four games, only yeah. one defeat. To be fair, a couple of draws in there. I, I was trying to remember what we discussed in terms of Steny at the the lower league preview podcast. I I. I thought Steny would do well, but I thought they had a very shallow squad. Yeah. Certainly in terms of League Cup. Was, was there one of the games where you had like three yeah, trialists yeah. maybe on the That's bench? That's right. We played Aloha and had trialists. I didn't even think that was allowed in the League Cup. But I, I, I shared your thoughts, Sean. I think going into the season, I had thought that Steny Smear, Dumbarton and Forfra Athletic 
were the favourites to, to win the title. Two of those shouts miles off, given given where they, where they ended up finished. But Stennis Muir went into the season, I think that, as you mentioned there with Gary Naismith, he had upgraded problem areas. You and Fraser Clark touched on it on last week's show. The, on the, 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 the goalkeepers, Darren Jameson, Perhaps the best sign Stennis Muir have ever made. I don't say that. I don't say that lightly. Perhaps the best Stennis Muir signing that, that Stennis have ever made. Just somebody who has had such a transformative impact on the team. Like one of the players told me on Saturday, under the previous one of the previous goalkeepers, he nicknamed him Corner Brennan because he was terrified of balls going into the box. <laughs> which goalkeeper was it? <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell you which player it was, but uh, you know, you, you you certainly know the goalkeeper. <laughs> But with, with, with Darren Jameson, it's like if, if Nicky Jameson or Gregory Buchanan don't head it, he'll get it. And when you've got a goalkeeper like that, to, to play in front of that is, must be great. And it's just a fan. We, we spoke about it before as a fan. When you, when you don't worry about stuff like that, it, it's great. And we had two years of terrible goalkeepers. Mm-hmm. Ryan Marshall, like David Wilson, Connor Brennan. Nice guys. I'm all sure they're really lovely guys. It's not personal. They just weren't very good. And the whole team suffered for it. And I actually think that Stephen Swift might have kept his job if, or some of you could have got promoted if they had a good goalkeeper under under Stephen Swift. Then he signs, he basically does a straight swap with Dumbarton, bringing in Gregor Buchanan for, for Sean Crichton. And I thought we're just going to get like effectively the same player, except one had longer hair than the other. But Buchan- Buchanan's been excellent. Buchanan has, has been absolutely terrific in just terms of his leadership and organisation. Scored six goals for the season, played 31 games, kept 19 clean sheets in them. So the guy, the guy's an absolute rock. And on top of that, those two players have made Nicky Jameson better. Jameson's had an absolute outstanding season and he's he's turned into a really good defender. I think perhaps he's shown that he's too good for League Two level. Like he's big, he's strong, he's fast, he can head on the ball. All the things you want in a centre-back, and I think that he can thrive one level higher. Mikey Anderson's turned into one of the best midfielders in the division, working well alongside Nat Weatherburn. And the front four, yes, they've been misfiring recently. One goal in the last um, five matches tells its own story. But between the Matt Aitken had a good season, largely, and the boys in playing behind them, Adam Brown scored one of the best goals I've seen at Oakville against Peter Head. Matt Aitken's fingers crossed we can keep him for next season. And Uno Riley, just one of the most exciting players in the in the division. And I think it was a small squad, but that's something that we've been very, very fortunate with. No injuries. Gary Naismith has, has pretty much every single week been able to call along the same 11 players. And it's only latterly with injuries that I don't think Nicky James is going to play again this season. I think Nat Weatherburn miss out for the rest of the season. But it's done. There's four games left to go. There, there, I mean, since we will play a massive part, it happens at the bottom of the table because mm-hmm. we're playing Clyde, Sinrar and Bonnie Rig in the last three matches. So we'll play a huge part about what happens down at the bottom. But for us as a team, there's there's no pressure on us. So I thought that we I thought we'd get into the playoffs. But as soon as we went in that mid, mid winning run from um, the start of November, that was it. That was it, man. Because you went from, was it 4th of November till kind of mid-January, you won 12 games in a row, 12 yeah. games in a row, is that right? Yeah. Now, I know you've already said that it was the game uh, at Bonnerick after you'd lost, after you'd been kind of hammered by Clyde, yeah. that, that weird game, 6-1. But there was no point in that, that winning run of 12 games that you thought, actually, we're going to win the league. That, surely there must have been. There was a game... It, it, it was crazy because there were some of those games that we didn't necessarily play well and some of those games that, that we, we should have drawn. There was a game against the East Fife, for instance. 2-0, cruising. But uh, Nathan Austin scored an injury time. And then right at the end, the ball broke the edge there. Conor McManus, who hit the thing and forced Darren Jameson to, to palm it away. That could have easily broken the broken it. But so, so we weren't fantastic in all of those games. Sometimes it was luck. But one of the things that the, the whole team's built on is the defence and the bedrock and the attitude. Like guys, the 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 the, the goalkeeper, two centre backs, Ross Meekin at right back and Kinley Billum at left back. Kinley Billum's had a breakout season. Really, really good player. I think he can easily play one level higher as well. But it was we, we were were so difficult to beat. But there was a game. It was in December. I think it was the start of December against Dumbarton. Really good game of football. Hundred percent hit should have finished nil nil. Good game of football, not a lot of action happening in it. 
But then five minutes to go, Matty, Matty Yates does some great stuff down the left, tees up Mikey Anderson on the edge of the box, who hits it, has a pot shot for the edge of the area. Brett Long is diving to cover it, but it whacks off James <laughs> Berry's arse and just goes into the net. And it's at that point there that you're thinking, fucking hell, this is really, really, this is really, really good. And then a couple of weeks later, go to the Spartans and beat them 2-0. And the Spartans were doing really well at that point. Those are the games. It was a Dumbarton one, wasn't it? The Spartans game. And um, that's when we were at Montrose, or sorry, sorry we, we were hospitality at Montrose. You were in Australia at the time. So I wasn't at the game. But these are the games, like beating the, the big teams around you. And, and then just like, just you begin to pull away from them. And it was around those points, like something special was happening here. Had, have you ever, because I remember like that, like I've, I've seen a couple of kind of title winning Wraith Rose teams. There's only been one where I've thought this, but has there been, points at this season where you have and bear in mind this very rarely happens uh, if, if you support one of the smaller teams where you literally turn up on a Saturday and think we're going to win today yeah yeah it's a good feeling but, isn't it it very rarely happens I, the, the Des McEwen's team of 2005-2006 that was like back the second season I'd, I'd started like following the club like going home and away every week and that was brilliant like what's happening? What what are you doing today, Craig? Off to get three points, of course. <laughs> you know, total arrogant. And there was never a point where it was ever like disrespectful to the other teams because mm-hmm. the, I mean I don't think there's any like outrageously bad sides in in League Two this season. I think if you're if you're going to win, you're going to have to play hard on them. But yeah, like you're taking on Stranraer at home, you're taking on Elgin at home, you're taking on really bad Clyde teams. I know Cl- Clyde ultimately gave us a bit of a chasing, but you're going to these games thinking, yeah, play well, we'll win. That was it. We just, if we play well, we'll win. Take it serious and we'll win. And it's great because we've very much got the boys that take it seriously. And there's uh, the standards, like, as I mentioned earlier, the, the pressure I get from Naismith is, like, he's quite quite long leash with the players in that, reg- in that regard. Like, he trusts them to be able to look after themselves. But I think that they've set such a high standard for themselves that it's very difficult for them to, to fall, fall below it. And that's that's allowed us to go on that that twelve game winning run. So in terms of so in terms of Gary Nesmith, you've already mentioned that the, the players would run through uh, brick walls for him. What do you think he is doing that is that is kind of getting such buy in? Well, I, I suppose to to go back to to your your first point there about whether or not I, I fancied him, I think that he he inherited a team that were fairly down the, 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 their knees down, down he's down on their luck, I would say. I think they had some capable players in the team, but just Stephen Swift had signed like a really unbalanced squad. Like like Stephen Swift wasn't a very good manager at Stennis Spear. And I think that I had reasonable expectations for him, but he just didn't deliver. I think that he'd never had like quite a bit of money to play with in, in, in his career as a manager. And so it was just like like football manager. Oh, I've heard of him. He's got two stars. We'll sign him. You know? <laughs> and I think that we had a good chance to get into the playoffs last season, but we, we were beaten by some of the worst sides in the division. I remember going to Albany Rovers and getting spanked 3-0 by them. Joe Bevan, absolutely running right there, couldn't touch them. I remember at that point thinking, like, well, basically he's got to sign his own players, like properly sign his own players and get a, a pre-season behind them. But I remember thinking, I'm disappointed that he didn't get the team into the playoffs. It's all academic now, right, because you know, the guy can do no wrong in my eyes. But at that point, it was it was very much like, like we need to see something better here. And I think what is the, the players like about him, stuff I've touched on there, the fact that he, he's got like a, he's a relatively big name in Scottish football. You know, he's played for Hearts, played for Everton, won caps for Scotland. So I think straight away, you've got someone who's got the buy-in from the players. Mm-hmm. One of the other players had said when I was talking to him, and this is just this was just an example he gave of how, how highly he holds Gary Naismith. Wraith Rovers were in for him, and he was, was quite interested in, in talking to him Kelty Hearts had tried to sign him I think, a year previously or six months previously, a year previously, but they had the, that backroom team obviously have moved en masse to, to to Wraith Rovers and they were they were keen to bring him. This must have been the time when you were kind of going through a bit of a centre back uh, crisis. Dan O'Reilly had moved on, etc. When are we not? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But he was like, the, the, he told the manager, and the manager was just like, well, you know, you do what's best for yourself. You know, you mean you basically just like didn't try to keep him or to 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 try and sell the club to him. He basically just got to do what's best for yourself and whatever you think's right, you'll have my blessing. 
and the player ultimately decided to to, to stay at Stennis Muir. And that's that's great to hear. The fact that he could have gone and played full time football, he could he could have been playing prem, might be playing, he could be in a position where he's playing Premiership football next season, you know. And the fact that he's chosen to to stay part time and playing with Stennis Muir, that's amazing to hear that he's created that culture just where the players want to buy into it, treating people like adults, not trying to be like a salesman or anything to them, just being honest and open with them. And that's, I think that's that's um, helped build that culture. And I know that it's probably not something that that you've necessarily thought about, but the the fact that that the Steady have done so well this season is there perhaps a concern that some of the players might. I mean, you've mentioned it already with with, with Jameson that some of the players might attract suitors at a higher level. I suppose the only player who's out of contract at the moment is Matty Yates, and. There's talk he might be staying on for next season. I think he really likes it here. I think all the players like really like it here. However, he has got the opportunity. He's young enough, and I think he's got the profile and the opportunity to maybe go full time. And that's that's fair enough. If he goes, like club legend, you won the league with us. You scored some amazing goals. Like well done. The guys that I think can really kick on. The there's I'll give you three: Nicky Jameson, who I've spoken about, Kenley Billum, the left back. I think we've we've done really well to get him signed up for another year. Michael Anderson is the mm-hmm. other one. Michael Anderson was one of the BSC lot, like one of the one we signed those six players. And to begin with, he just he looked like a competition winner. He, he didn't know what his best position was. He looked quite slight, easy to push off the ball. And just any time that, that he played, you're thinking, what's he going to offer? What is he going to offer us? There's a game against Elgin in 2022. I remember seeing him starting thinking, geez, what the fuck's Anderson starting for? And it looked like N'Golo Kante was playing for Stennis Muir. Like, he was absolutely <laughs> amazing, just like on top of people straight away, moving the ball on quickly, set up one of the goals. And you're really thinking, right, this guy looks class. Can he kick on? And last season, it didn't quite happen for him. But I think since Naismith's come in, he's like the first name, one of the first names in the team sheet. He's such a good player. Everyone else in that team, you talk to them about Mikey Anderson, they can't believe how good a player he is. And he's someone that could definitely kick on. I think that he's quite a... He's quite a low maintenance sort of personality. He's quite quiet. He does what he's told. But I think the the better the teams get in, and as his role within the team, his his speciality, he's such an important player for the team to role. He's becoming more confident, and I think that that he might fancy playing higher up the food chain at some point. I think he does. He's got quite a decent job outside of football. I think he's an engineer or something like that. So I don't think it'd be a money issue. It's just whether or not he, he fancies it. But he's contract for life at Stenning as far as I'm concerned the guy's brilliant the guy's a great player and obviously everything has went but it couldn't have went any better mm. uh, on the park is there, 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 has everything went really well it kind of feels like everything's went really well off the park as well just in terms of I know it, to a degree it doesn't really matter a job but it's even just things like Stenning's social media yeah feels like that's been great this season they, and I, I, like in terms of how that impacts online Stenning fans it, it, it's it all feeds into this kind of positive energy, I suppose. Totally, totally. I mentioned Ian Fitzpatrick earlier and him and his team deserve enormous credit this season. Connor Ferguson, Rennie, Angus Blacklock, Chris McMillan, all guys, lovely, lovely guys as well. Really easy to talk to and really, really, really easy to get on with. And I remember like, like talking to Connor and and going in he, after one of the games, he said, like, as a fan, what sort of stuff are you looking to see? And I was like, basically what you guys are doing. It's like really good. Like the, the graphics, like the, the stuff that Ian Fitzpatrick's created, the graphics, when you see it online, it just looks so professional. And I know that prof- professional is the bare minimum, but it just it looks really stylish and eye-catching. And it's the sort of stuff when you see it, it's like, I, I really, really want to want to see what else it's got to offer. And unfortunately, they're all stepping down at the end of the season. Like like Ian, I think Ian's just taking some time off. I think the, I mean, they're, all, they're all volunteers. So it's like a, a lot of work for not much in return. Ian's taking a break. Connor is, he's a Dunfermline supporter. He's going to join Dunfermline for a paid role. Chris McMillan, he's joining Dunfermline as well. He was a commentator at Dumbarton, commentator at He's one of the best in the business. I think Angus is going abroad for his studies. So it's whoever comes in next, and there's Bobby Nwanzi who's coming in next. He said that he's coming in as head of media on, on Sam North's like, vlog. So he's got big shoes to fill. He's got big shoes to fill because the team just do such a good job and they, they should be really proud of the work that they've put in. We've said that to them. Like, the stuff, the videos that you've created, we'll be watching these 
years down the line. We were watching the, the, the video of the players shaking hands with these five team and then realising that the league's been won. Amazing. Then everyone jumping in, everyone jumping in. The, 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 the celebration has changed. We watched that for a long time. So that's that's amazing. But on top of that, Ian McMenemy's stepping down at the end of the season. You know, I think that the club has grown massively under his stewardship. Like he, he was talking, again, referring back to the Sam North video, he said like we had a fairly modest budget when he first started. Now it's one of the best budgets in the division. And it's reflected like, I mean, we have got a good budget. There's no no shine away from it. We, we you you A lot of the time, the team that pays the best has got the best players and you can you get all this tendon stuff that comes with it. Let's not be squeamish about it. I'm not like, um, like uh, uh, so when somebody says like about Edinburgh City, you paid your players a lot of money. Us, little Edinburgh, we didn't pay our, <laughs> we, we didn't pay our players a button. Uh, so there's a lot of good stuff done there. So whoever comes into the place, Ian has got like, a, a big job to do. We've got the a boys coming on the board, a director, I can't remember his name, but he is like, lock hire. The sponsors who have who have done us a great turn, a, a really, really good turn, just in terms of the infrastructure they've helped put in. So the club, for whoever comes in to kick it on, the club, there's a lot of stuff there that's in a really good place. So so I suppose in terms of going forward, how, and, and I know ultimately, at this moment of time, the, 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 the proper answer is, I probably don't care. However, how do you think Steny will get on next season? It's a good question. It's a good question because I think that the, there's there's obvious a step up in in quality from from League Two to League One. Some people don't think there is, but 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 there is. There's a massive step really up. Is. And I look at like Annan, for instance, and just the fact that they have spent virtually the whole season in ninth place, and had it not been for the fact that Edinburgh City were were at financial problems, it would be interesting to see if it had been a bit more competitive at the at the bottom of the table. Stennis Muir going up with virtually the same group of players as well. I think the only player out of contract who would want to stay is Matty Yates. I think the rest of them might be moved on. I think if Gary Naismith is able to sign some defensive cover, another central midfielder, wide player, another striker to to push Matty Aitken up front, I think we can make an impact. I, I do think we can, not just staying up, but like being, being a competitive side. I just look at that defence. I look at that defence, look at that back four, look at the goalkeeper and a team that have kept 19 clean sheets in 31 games. That's incredible. You know, if, you, if you're going to beat Steny, you're going to have to work, apart from the Clyde match, like it's just, <laughs> got, everything's got to be caveated with that Clyde Almost game. all the goals you can see <laughs> the season was in that one game. <laughs> I think Clyde, Clyde has scored nine goals against us. Like, how, how, how did that, how have Clyde scored nine goals against us? But but if you're if you're going to you've you've got to be hard to to you've got to play well if you want to beat us, and on top of that as well, the team spirit that he's fostered. Not going to say like just because everyone gets on well with each other, you're going to win all your games. But I, I do think that helps. Like obviously this season has been largely just one up upward curve. There's been there's been not a lot of knocks, and any time there has been a defeat, it's been followed up immediately with a win. So there hasn't really been long setback, long periods of setback or anything like that. I do think the players are resilient enough to deal with it. And I do think they've got each other's backs if anything does happen. So I would be, I'd be quite confident that we can go and kick on and have a successful season. Obviously on paper, we're not the best like League Two winners of all time. You can maybe see that just because like, we've not scored a lot of goals recently. Our, our points total is not massive, but we're just, we're really, really difficult to beat really difficult to beat and I think that'll go a long way I mean I, I suppose just off the top of my head uh, I, I haven't checked back or whatever but I remember the remember the, the Montrose side that won uh, that won yeah. League 2 uh, and it kind of always felt like maybe Peter Head would get it maybe Peter Head would get it but Montrose get, just kept churning out clean sheets defensively they were, they were absolutely exceptional I suppose ultimately they've, they've went on to be a, a, a good League 1 team so perhaps there's no reason that, that Steny couldn't do something similar. I know that the stars have to align. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's, there's no reason that the there's no reason that the the fun time stopped now. I think it sort of perhaps goes on to a wider discussion of of part time football in Scotland because in, there's never been like one like amazing like part time side. You're 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 up and down. I mean, if you think about like who's the best part time part part time team in the country, well, it's our broth. 
Yep. I mean, they've, if you see to remember when Dick Campbell took over, for instance, they were, what, ninth place in, mm-hmm. in League Two and really, really struggling. And now they're, they're, they're going to be relegated from the championship. It'll be interesting to see how they get on in League One under Jim McIntyre. I think some of their better players might move on, probably to East Fife, where, where Dick Campbell is. So they're really going to go th- be going through a period of transition at the moment. So they might not, they might no longer be the dominant part-time team. Montrose, for instance, just to bring that back to them, for years when I started going to watch Dennis Muir, they were, you were guaranteed three points off East Stirlingshire and Montrose. <laughs> They were the two teams you were guaranteed points off off them, and and now like to finish bottom of the table could have easily dropped into the Highland League mm-hmm. had it not been for for Brewer Rangers all going on honeymoon at the same time um, as each <laughs> other or whatever the whatever the story was there. And, and now look at it, it just shows like if you've got a good manager in the dugout, good players that buy into what the manager's doing, a board who believe in what the club's doing, and and let's face it, aren't afraid to stick their hand in their pocket that. The money, money talks. Like I know that's a, a total cliche thing to say, but if you've got all these factors, and and uh, the big thing as well, I really hope that Stennis Muir can can just build on the the support. I imagine there's going to be more season tickets next season. People who have been accustomed to winning this year, I don't think it's going to be quite as straightforward <laughs> as that in in League One. But I'll I'll certainly be there. I'll certainly be there, and I'd like to think, yeah, that, that the team can. Montrose are the team to emulate. When you think about part-time teams at the moment, Montrose are both, they're the teams to emulate. Because I know that, for instance, I'm sort of dragging this answer out, but you look at our both, you know, you say it might not be a necessary success on the pitch, off the pitch, however, all that money after the season where they, they almost got into the Premiership, reinvested in the club and Gayfield, I mean, I've not been to, I'll be going to next season, but Gayfield's apparently a completely different place to go to since it's all been spruced up. And it's just like a really, really good positive experience as a as a fan to go at. And that's the sort of thing that will keep the club going for another, what, 10, 15 years before yep. the next uh, bit of uh, redevelopment needs to be done at Gayfield. So, aye, I'm, you, you're right. You're right. There's no reason to say why the team can't go out. If they can go up and stay up, uh, hopefully they can they can kick on. And maybe, who knows, you might see us battling out with Kilmarnock to get into the Premiership. <laughs> Is there is there anything else or anyone else that you think I we haven't covered that we should that we should discuss at this moment in time? I don't think so. I don't think so. That's that's really thorough. I suppose the only question remaining is like who is the player of the year? And that's that's a difficult question because I think there's five legitimate contenders. I think when you when you whittle down the long list, you've probably got about three. And I think then the short list is probably between Jameson, Jameson and Buchanan. And I'd probably have to give it to Gregor Buchanan. Mm-hmm. I just yeah. think he's been he's been an excellent signing, captain the team. Like I think he's missed one match all season with a with a sort of like a dead leg knee injury or something that he had. Scored six times. It's just a phenomenal season. But that says just it's been an amazing season. Like you don't history is a funny thing. You don't you don't realize that you're going through it until after the fact. But I realized that when we were winning, like. 10, 11, 12 games and all like, you'll never see this again. You will you will never you will never see this again. Club have club waited 140 years, never done it before, win 12 games in the bounds. Win a league title, you know, might win a league title again, but I don't think it'll be as good as that. Th- those feelings that people experienced on Saturday, they'll they'll probably never feel feel like again. Say they could win, say they could win League One next season. Say they could get relegated and then win League Two again the following season, you know. I don't think it'll be as good as that. That was just 140 years of pent up frustration, just all gushing out all at once in the most glorious, fantastical way possible. Well, listen, we have been uh, we have been close associates for a, for a long time now, but I am I was delighted for you. Ah, thank you. Mate. I'm delighted for Steny, and and thanks for thanks for the time you spent with me and uh, describing Steny's season. Thank you. Excellent. Cheers, Sean. But believe me, the pleasure was all mine. <laughs> The pleasure was all mine. <laughs> Say that. Right, take care. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.